a foundation guide to 80 meters, exploring the 3.5 megahertz amateur band. Welcome to the 3.5 megahertz amateur band, where we'll explore the characteristics, equipment, antennas, and propagation that make this a popular frequency for amateurs around the world. If you haven't done so, I recommend having a look at my foundation guide to 40 meters, because a lot of the characteristics and comments made in that video also apply on 80 meters. A lot of amateurs are sentimental about 80 meters, because at least in Australia, many had their first contacts on this band. Our old novice license used to only allow operation on 80, 15 and 10 meters. And especially at night or during low sunspot years, 80 meters was the only band that you could get a contact on. Later licensing changes opened up access to 40 meters, two meters and 70 centimeters. So 80 meters is not the focal point that it once was. Like on 40 meters, there's a wide range of equipment for 80, ranging from commercial gear, which nearly always includes 80 meters, unless it's a simple one or two band QRP rig, kit equipment, where 80 meters is also sometimes offered, as well as home brew gear. It's particularly easy to build equipment for 80 meters, and a lot of amateurs, including myself, built their first rig and had their first contacts on this band. An 80 meter CW or double sideband rig might need only five, six, or seven transistors. And you can obtain frequency agility with ceramic resonators. With transmitters, you don't need many amplifying stages to go from a few milliwatts to a few watts. That's because gain per transistor stage is higher on lower frequency bands like 80 meters compared with higher HF or VHF bands. Common and cheap transistors like the BD139 can easily give you a couple of watts output on 80 meters, making them workable for QRP transmitter finals. Receiving is also simpler on 80 meters. Because the noise level is fairly high, you don't need the ultimate insensitivity to be able to hear down to the noise floor. So a simple direct conversion receiver needing only a few transistors can do quite well. And you probably don't need an RF preamp per head of the detector. Again, making construction simpler. So I'm reading you three to four, so you must be having quite a good signal over here to me. Frequency agility is another thing. You can get crystals, a common crystal frequency is 3.58 megahertz. That used to be the color burst crystal used in American TVs. Depending on which country you're in, that can be a suitable frequency for CW, digital modes, or phone operating. A problem with crystal controlled rigs on 80 meters is they're not frequency agile and it's hard to make them pull more than a couple of kilohertz in a VXO circuit. That's where ceramic resonators come to the rescue. 3.58 megahertz is again a common frequency, and if you build a VXO with one, you can get an 80 or 100 kilohertz span. Depending on which country you're in, that can give you good coverage of CW or SSB parts of the band. You might also be able to get ceramic resonators for 3.69 megahertz. Again, that may be useful depending on which country you're in. If you're looking for a simple project to build for 80 meters, my recommendations are the same as for 40 meters. Go with a simple direct conversion CW or double sideband transceiver. Or if you've already got a receiver, just build the transmitter first and have a transmit receive switch so you can switch the antenna between the two.
What about antennas on 80 meters? That's where a lot of people come unstuck. Because an 80 meter antenna, like a half wave dipole, is 40 meters from end to end. That's too big for many housing lots. It's okay though, if you're able to zigzag the end to the dipole or have them coming down to the ground or a fence level. That's called an inverted V. Another thing you can do to shorten an 80 meter antenna is to insert loading coils. You can get reasonable performance with an antenna that's only 20 meters from end to end. Although you will find the bandwidth is narrow and that can be a problem on 80 meters because it's such a wide band in many countries. You may have to make a choice then between whether you want the antenna for the CW end of the band or the SSB portion, particularly in countries like the United States where they've got the whole 500 kilohertz for 80 meters. Another possibility, if you don't have much space, is magnetic loops. Though again, on 80 meters, it can be difficult to get good efficiency. You're doing well if you're getting 1%. Although there have been people that have built giant magnetic loops of say 3 to 5 meters in diameter that have got good results. They are quite complex engineering projects but if you're good with a welder and have plenty of scrap metal then it would be a worthwhile project. Vertical antennas are another possibility especially if you're working DX. A 20 meter long tower is a quarter wavelength on 80 meters or you might be able to shunt feed the tower using antennas on the top as a top hat to provide extra capacitance. That's a choice that Ardent DXs often favour. Like on 40 meters, different antennas give different results and your choice of antenna should be influenced by what you want from 80 meters. Whether you want to have local rag chewing up to a few hundred kilometers or whether you favour long distance DXing. For example, a low dipole and low is almost any practical height on 80 meters will give you good high angle radiation which is good for people closer in up to several hundred kilometers whereas a vertical antenna gives you good low angle radiation and that's good for DXing but make sure you've got a good ground system below you because the performance of the ground system i.e. lots of radials and preferably conductive soil has a big bearing on the DX performance of a vertical antenna What's 80 meter propagation like? It's a bit different from 40 meters in that there's less activity during the day and it's not so dependent on the vagarities of the solar cycle, particularly in low sunspot years. In most cases, the critical frequency exceeds 3.5 megahertz, meaning you can get blanket coverage at almost any time of night. 80 meters is also generally known as a nighttime band, though that's not necessarily always true. During the day, particularly at a low sunspot time of the year and at high latitudes, you can make reasonable distance contacts on 80 meters, up to say two or 300 kilometers. At night, with QRP on 80 meters, you can routinely get contacts up to maybe three, four or 500 kilometers. In fact, those sorts of distances are where 80 meters is excellent, particularly at night, where there's less foreign QRM than you might get on 40 meters which propagates better at longer distances. You can get even further on 80 meters, but it becomes harder and signal levels gradually drop off. Nevertheless, with QRP on 80 meters, you can sometimes get 2000 or more kilometer contacts. It's very rewarding when you do, as it's a much less frequent occurrence than on other bands like 40 and 20 meters. 80 meter allocations vary around the world. The US has the biggest slice with 3.5 to 4 megahertz being the 80 meter band. Although you might see reference to 75 meters, which relates to the top end of the band around 4 megahertz. The Europeans normally have 3.5 to 3.8 megahertz. The New Zealanders 3.5 to 3.9 and us here in Australia 3.5 to 3.7, with another allocation a bit below 3.8. If you're a hardcore 80 meter DXer, you'll find DX activity just below 3.8. As for where you'll find activity in various modes, you'll find CW in the section just above 3.5. SSB is found from the top end of the band down. 
in the US 3.8 to 4 megahertz, in Europe 3.6 to 3.7 up to 3.8 and here in Australia above about 3.55 through to 3.7 as well as the DX activity just below 3.8. Most phone activity on 80 meters is on SSB though in some countries you'll find some AM as well. Digital modes may be around 3.6 give or minus a large margin. Look at your country's band plan to see the most popular frequencies for your particular digital mode. What's 80 meter activity like? It's a bit like 40 meters in that contacts are often between people within their own country or state. Local clubs or groups may also have regular nets on 80 meters, often every week but sometimes even every night. Activity generally is less than 20 years ago but it may come into its own again when sunspot numbers drop and 40 metres becomes less useful for closer in contacts. 80 metres has suffered from rising domestic noise levels. But if you are able to operate portable, 80 metres can be surprisingly rewarding for the contacts that you get and the stations that you can hear. If you are more happy to chat with a local than exchange a 20 second signal report with a DX station, then 80 metres could hold a lot of appeal for you especially if you work during the day and can only be on air at night. This has been our look at 80 metres. If you haven't sampled the band before, why not tune around with a web controlled remote receiver? Just do a search in Google under remote SDR or web controlled receiver or similar. You'll be able to find receivers in other countries and sample what 80 meters sounds like over there. Or there may even be one closer to home where you can listen to 80 meters, including your fellow countrymen, without having a receiver yourself. Or if you've got a receiver, why not try plugging in almost any antenna, even just a few meters of wire. You'll probably hear 80 meter activity. It's normally in lower sideband and if you tune from 3.5 to 3.7 or 4 megahertz, depending on what your band limits are, you should be able to hear something. The evening is normally the most popular time, but you'll also hear activity in the late afternoon and early morning as well. If you want to make the most of low power amateur radio, you need minimum QRP. It's a Kindle ebook available for under $5 US. For more information, go to vk3ye.com and click on the link or search minimum QRP in Amazon. <laughs>